Yeah, she has. Well, it's the final night of our spring 2019 conference. Adeline looks like she's happy. I don't think anybody else is happy. I think everybody's like, huh. No, I know it's been a long week, but it's been a fulfilling week, hasn't it? I've been very encouraged by the response of our folks. Uh, um, I ran into Ruth before she came in, and she was telling me how she felt like that she's gotten more out of this than just about anything she's been to. Um, they were talking Tuesday night after Justin had preached. It felt like we ought to start at 6, give him an extra hour to preach. And uh, uh, and uh, last night someone was talking about how you know the things that Kelly said. And uh, it's just been such a... Uh, a good week, and, and we're so pleased to uh, uh, to continue tonight. And uh, I've got a see. Let me change Bibles because I know you'll have ESV. This is, I'm give you this one. And we're going to take our uh, opening scripture from uh, Psalm 130. Psalm 130. Our call to worship. Oh, and Sam, uh, um, probably a bad time to tell you we're going to do it in Christ alone. Oh, you got it. You are the man, see? Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's all stand and sing together the hymn, O Christ Alone.
thank you. You may be seated. Aren't you glad for that? That there's nothing that can pluck you out of the hand of our God in heaven. You are in Christ's hand and Christ's hand is in the Father's hand. I'm pretty sure you can't get out, right? Aren't you thankful for that? Don't want out, ain't it? <laughs> we don't want out. All right, if you have a praise or testimony you'd like to offer up this evening, you can do that. Yeah, they did a good job. Yeah. Had a good. Good. Glad to hear that. Yep. Bill, it was a virus, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Bill's feeling. Bill Cottle's feeling a little better today. He didn't want to come tonight because it was hard on him last night. So, uh, but he's having a better day today. That's good news. Um, anyone else? Uh, you've, any, have you enjoyed your week? Yeah, it's been good, hasn't it? All right. If you have an unspoken request, show raising your hand. If you'd like to uh, share with us a prayer request that be upon your heart, uh, you could do that this evening. Yep. Richard Curry, Danny Lucas. Anyone else? You know, it doesn't have to be a person. It can be something you want to pray for. Um, we Todd sure give, had given us a lot to pray about last night, didn't he? Yep. The fame of the the fame of Jesus Christ to be spread around the world. Yep. And what did he say? Forty percent of people groups uh, in the world had not been reached by the gospel. That's incredible. Oh, yeah, that's a, an indictment, isn't it? An indictment on us. So, uh, i tell you, these guys, they preached this week, made me want to charge hell the squirt gun, ain't you? I'm telling you. Ready to ready to make your way down, anyway. Anyway. Well, would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the week that we've had together as your people. I have enjoyed hearing the testimonies of people, the the buzz in the church for the blessing that they've received through the preaching of God's Word, uh, through the worship of Jesus Christ. Uh, and we just have uh, been so thrilled, Lord, that we have these men who have gathered together with us, who have put in the great effort of... Um, Toiling over a sermon, pouring over God's word, spending time in prayer, that they may give to our people a piece of that, a piece of them, Lord. And Lord, we have been filled up to the brim. So we ask you bless each and every one of those men that have given to us uh, this week. We ask your blessing on Chris this evening, Father. I am so thankful for him, for his friendship, uh, for his kindness to me, for his love for Jesus Christ. And when I, I see him do what he does, Lord, he makes me want to be a better pastor. So I pray your blessing upon Chris. Um, I pray, God, you'd help him tonight to preach the glorious riches of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you'll open our hearts to hear what you have to teach us through your word. I pray your blessing upon him and his church. I pray, God, you might fill his church up with people to hear the gospel. And I pray that because I know the man preaches the gospel. And I know if they come to him, they will hear Christ died for their sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. They'll hear it every week, week in, week out, over and over and over again. So I ask you bless his church. Lord, I pray that you'd give him souls for the labor that he's done, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd bless his family, be with his wife as she supports him, his little children. We rejoice that Mikey was saved, and we pray for his little girl. 
pray, God, that very soon that she will also come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray, God, that you'll give Chris good health. Lord, I pray he'll be decades from now preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the glory of God. Bless him, O Lord. I pray, God, you'll bless our church. Thank you for what we've heard. I pray, God, we'll be a better church, a healthier church, a faithful church. Lord, that you'll put your desires, your desires into us, God, that we will pray for your will to be done. God, that we would hunger and thirst to be in your will. I pray, God, that we will have a great zeal for the lost to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that don't know the Savior like it would be just, just, just like eating, Lord, or drinking something. that It would be that routine for us, Father. So I pray we'll be a church that loves sharing the gospel. Thank you for these prayer requests that have been lifted up to you. We give praise that Bill feels better. We pray for him continually, Lord, that you will grant him a healing in this. We thank you for Scott's dad that he's better. We lift up prayer, Lord, for um, those that were mentioned for Richard Curry, for Richard Curry, and for Danny Lucas, and all these others that uh, uh, people care about. Bless the fellowship. Bless the Mullins family as they come and sing. And we pray these things in the blessed name of our dear Savior, Jesus Christ. And amen. Let's uh, take a moment and uh, hear from the Mullins family. They're going to come and sing for us.
So we have a treat for you. You all got to hear Rebecca quite a bit, so we're going to feature Corey this time and uh, going to just listen to the words of it for you. Morning, I see you in the sunrise every morning. It's like a picture that you painted for. Right. 
share something with you. I, I was troubled in a dream the other night after I listened to the, the preacher. and uh, 
Sometimes God wakes you up, and uh, and I've been wrestling about going to be obedient to the Spirit because the story I'm going to tell you is a true story, and it's not about me. But I know the people personally that's involved, and I know the preacher couldn't tell it to you because he don't know them. But uh, or maybe I don't know who needs to hear this. Maybe uh, maybe it's just me, but. I tell people all the time the most da- person in danger of hell's fire is the person sitting in the church pew that thinks they're saved and they're not. Because lo and behold, the, the drug dealer down on the corner or the crooked politician would see their sin and praise God maybe one day repent and be saved. But a person that sits week after week and thinks they're okay, will they ever see their sin? I'm going to tell you a story of a lady that did just that and how gracious our God is that he doesn't, that He will extend his grace to anyone. A lady that I, the church I was ordained over in Logan years ago, uh, she was what you would call the Sunday school superintendent, a secretary. You know how the ladies that count how many people's here and can take up the money or whatever. Very faithful servant of the Lord. Years upon years was there before I ever went to the church there. I don't know how many years she served. But lo and behold, she went to the doctor and she got some bad news and they wanted to operate. And uh, they went and they operated on her. And as the case, I mean, times uh, people want to talk about seeing the other side of heaven or I've talked to people who's done it personally, but uh, they lost her on the operating table. And then they got her back and uh, she was in recovery and then later after her pastor uh, came and talked to her she was absolutely terrified and she was honest with him she didn't see no two white lights or see all of her loved ones before she said Jim I woke up and I was in hell I was on fire now whether that was a dream or whether that was real I don't know but she was gone Medically, she was not here. I mean, they did take the tumor out and and, uh, the cancer, but you know what she did? She repented of her sins. She says, I've been trying to be a good person, and I believe that lie all my life as a little boy not knowing any better. You know, the, the lie that they tell you, good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. That's not true. Redeemed people go to heaven, unredeemed people go to hell. She gave her heart to the Lord and was baptized and served the Lord the rest of her days. And you know what happened amazingly? That husband of hers that really just was kind of nonchalantly not concerned one way or the other, he seen the change in his wife's life. And he knew that she had something he didn't have. And he gave his heart to the Lord and uh, was baptized as well. Now that's a true story, friend. I don't care if you, we've come here for all week long. You may be uh, a member I don't know if it may not mean to anybody, but it might mean for the preacher or whatever. He might share that with another congregation. But I had to share that with you because, like I say, uh, sometimes we're troubled. And I was troubled. And I said, Lord, why Lord, would you bring that to my mind? He says, you have to share that. And so I'm pissed to be obedient. Yeah. That's right. We should be troubled, shouldn't we? Troubled. Troubled for the souls of others. And I'm glad you are, Wally. And I pray that I would be as well. You guys did fantastic. Thank you for singing for us. Well, just like I think Todd might have been the only one last night that needed an introduction. Um, These other guys have been around, and you guys have had them, been with them. Um, Chris Wilson's been in our pulpit several times without fail. He has always done a good job. He has always preached Christ. He's a good friend of mine. I love him very much. And uh, I hope that uh, I'd like to be a pastor like him. He's a good one. And uh, so, Chris, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your example. Please come share what the Lord has put upon your heart. Bless your heart, brother. Bless your heart. I love you. Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but it's storming outside. Um, I want to say first and foremost what a privilege it is to come and to open up God's word with you, the saints here at Williamson. Um, 
Let me say this. First, thank you for allowing me to come. Second, when I come, uh, I look for um, really uh, a couple people in particular. One of them is um, Sister Hazel. Um, the first time I was here, Sister Hazel made sure that I ate. And um, you don't know how many times that um, I think of Sister Hazel and uh, say a prayer for her as she serves faithfully here an hour from me. Um, I want to thank your pastor. Your pastor is a good friend of mine. Um, you know him better than I do. And um, he's, a, he's a good one. And if I live closer to Williamson, this is where I would go to church. And so God has me down there. And uh, I thank you for your friendship. I want to thank your sweet wife also. What a good example of a pastor's wife. Humble and compassionate. Uh, Heather and I, we look up to you all. And, and it's just a, just a privilege. So if you would, I would like for you to uh, turn in your Bible to the letter of 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. So Sunday night I was here. I got to, uh, to be with you. Now, if you notice, there's no one here from my church except me. So we call this Salt Peter after taxes. And um, I'm thrilled to be with you, though. Sunday night, uh, Brother Mike uh, brought the message on the first pillar of the church, which is the Word. Why do we have a pulpit in the middle of the church with a Bible open? Because everything we do centers around the Word. The second night, Brother Kelly, which is here, a good friend of mine, uh, brought you uh, pillar number two, uh, which is prayer. The third night, Brother Justin... Uh, brought you pillar number three, uh, which is the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Last night, Brother Todd came and he preached a good message, didn't he, uh, on missions. And so now it's like a pack mule amongst thoroughbreds. <laughs> and I'm here with you tonight. I know it's been a long week for you, though your soul is encouraged. Oftentimes your body is not so much. You're tired. I won't labor your patience tonight. But I would ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. 1 John chapter 1. Tonight we look to pillar um, number 5, fellowship. 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how grateful we are for this day, for this is the day that you have made. And Father, now we come to you with an open Bible and we ask you, God, to preach to the hearts of your people. We ask you, Father, to make us what we are not and to give us what we don't have. 
please God. We, we're not asking for revelation. We're, we're asking for illumination. So God, now, teach us and make us. If there's someone here, Father, that doesn't know you, I ask you, God, to grant them repentance and faith. May they see the beauty of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. While you're having a seat, let me read something to you. Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet, I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. We know that as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Jesus prays for his disciples. He prays for you as well. He prays for two things, truth and unity. My task that's been given to me is the topic of fellowship. And um, to understand, let me define fellowship for you. Fellowship is participation, sharing, and communion around the embrace of the gospel by the people of God. Let me make it clear. I know Brother Larry is with us here tonight. Fellowship is not mine and Larry's mutual respect for hot rods. Or mine and my, uh, Scott and I, our mutual respect for good fishing. Fellowship has to be centered around the gospel. Beloved, if you go this evening to the Mexican restaurant with your faith family here at church and you don't talk about the gospel, that's not fellowship. That's eating at the Mexican restaurant talking about other things. Can I get an amen? Okay. It's raining outside. Do you know that? Now, I want you to understand something. I, I hope that you hang out with your church family. I hope you talk about other things. I hope you're involved with each other's lives. But, beloved, the only what, reason that you can be involved with the people's lives around you is because one who came and died in your place and he has united you with other believers. Now, let's go back to 1 John. John is writing around the last part of the first century. John is probably the only one left, maybe a few more, if not the last apostle living at the time of the writing. His older brother James was killed probably mm, 30 years earlier. Time has passed quickly for John. The reason time has passed quickly for John is because he's devoted his life to two things. He's devoted his life for the caring of Jesus' mother. And he's devoted his life for the caring of Jesus' church. Mary has since passed away. Jerusalem is leveled and now John is living in Ephesus where he plays a crucial role in the surrounding churches. Persecutions have been fierce for the followers of Jesus, but that's not what is bothering John as he writes this letter. No. There's a different attack. The attack from Satan himself. This attack comes in the form of heresy. Blasphemous and damning teachings are popping up everywhere and are beginning to threaten the early church. There are people teaching that the word of God was not sufficient. They're teaching that salvation comes by higher knowledge only to the elite. And they're teaching that Jesus didn't really have a physical body. John clearly remembers Jesus teaching him about himself from what? The law, the prophets, and the writings. He also remembers Jesus he remembers the sound of Jesus' heartbeat when he laid his head upon his chest. A real body given for you. 
Well, now this is great. This is exactly what I've been looking for. John remembers. John remembers Jesus as he lays his head over on him. He can hear his heart beating. Are you still with me? Okay. I will. So he can remember three things. He can remember one, that Jesus, thank you, brother. He remembers one, that Jesus taught him from the Old Testament about himself. You know what that teaches us? That the Old Testament is sufficient. Number two, he remembers a real physical body because he could hear Jesus' heartbeat as he laid upon his breast. But he also remembers something else that this gospel message wasn't for the elite. This gospel message was for the outcast. This gospel message was for those on the outskirts of what? Of society. The leper. The one who um, had no way of coming. The one who was lowered down because he was a paralytic. That is who the gospel was for, not for the elite. The elite are the ones who nailed Jesus to a cross. John is older. But we also must remember that it's... Thank you so much, brother. We also must remember this, that John is still the same guy that Jesus nicknamed uh, the Son of Thunder. John is still... Yeah. yeah, brother, that's great. Thank you. You can't see your Bibles, can you? Okay. Okay. John is older, but he's still the son of thunder. Though he's mellowed out, John still has a fire that we have not yet seen. John will not stand for what's going on. John, in his letters, will demolish these heretical views, all the while encouraging his readers to keep pressing on. Beloved, you should keep pressing on, not by sheer determination, but you should keep pressing on because the gospel is real. Let me say this, the gospel is so real that it's important even when you don't have lights to preach it. The gospel is so real that it needs to be proclaimed to the nations. And it's here this reliance of the gospel, that we see the hope that John had, the hope in the light of the world. Now, yeah, that's, that's really good, in the light of the world, and we're sitting near this. John is going to combat a few different um, teachings. The first one he's going to kind of go against is that salvation comes from a higher knowledge. Listen close. Verse 1 says... That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Beloved, salvation does not come from a higher knowledge, but our calling into fellowship is by gospel proclamation. And notice he says, that which was from the beginning. The term that is broader than the word who, for it includes the person, the message, and the work of Jesus Christ. Oh, you see, beloved, this gospel, the gospel of the finished work of Christ, now let me make it very clear for you and for me, the message that Jesus came and he was born of a virgin, that he lived the life that you and I could not, would not, cannot live, and that he died in our place. Not only did he die in our place, but he was raised again on the third day for our justification. Oh, beloved, this is what was preached from the beginning. John didn't need a new gospel. John just needed someone to preach the gospel. 
You see, our calling into fellowship, this, this thing called the church, this, this sharing our lives together, you were called into that by the proclamation of the gospel. If you've come in any other way, like our brother was talking earlier, if you've been here and you think that you've come into the fellowship of this church because you signed a card, because you walked an aisle, because you said something that meant nothing to you, beloved, you have to understand today it's not how you get into a church. You are brought into the church by gospel proclamation. Now, notice there, I know you can't see your Bibles, but when you get home around the light, well, just remember what I said. <laughs> Look what he says there. This, this message, this, this, this gospel, this Jesus that, we, that we've had from the beginning, it's not something we just heard. Oh, yeah, we heard it, but we've seen it with our eyes. John is pulling rank. You guys say this, but guess what? I've seen it with my eyes. I've seen him, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Can you imagine how fired up John was? People coming in trying to destroy the church, the church that the one that he loved gave his life for. Oh, you know he was fired up. Verse 2 is kind of a parenthesis. Verse 2 is an explanation of, of this, this idea that is given in verse 1. So this idea in verse 1 says, we've looked upon him, we've seen him, we've heard him, we've touched him with our hands concerning the word of life. Beloved, what does it mean, this phrase, word of life? Well, you remember John's gospel says, in the beginning was the... I didn't hear you. Word. word. See, we have to do this because you might go to sleep. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word. Was with God and the Word. Was God. Yeah. This is John's way of explaining who Jesus is. The term is one of the names that John uses to describe Jesus. This, is, this has been written so that you may believe and that by believing you'll have life in his name, John says in his gospel. Beloved, this word of life is the one who gives life. This word of life, Jesus, he gives life and he gives it freely. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'm the way, the truth, and the what? The life. John knows his subject matter because John followed him for about three and a half years. Verse 2 explains verse 1. You'll have to take my word for it, but now verse 3 that which we've seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. You hear, notice what he says there? What, what he's seen, what he's heard, he proclaims everywhere he goes. Why is that? Because people are brought into fellowship with Christ and his church by the faithful proclamation of the gospel. How important is it for you to preach the gospel? Beloved, it's by the foolishness of preaching that men are saved. Now, you can sit there in the dark and say, well, that's Jared's problem. He's the preacher. Beloved, you need to preach to your children. You need to preach it to your spouse. You say, well, Brother Chris, my spouse, he's, he's, uh, he's already a Christian. Beloved, he needs it every day of his life. And so do you. Everywhere you go, every man, woman, boy, or girl you've ever seen needs the gospel. How does God bring people into his family? By the faithful proclamation of the gospel. You are called into fellowship that way. Well, I can't tell what you're looking like right now, but we're going to go to, to point number two. Our calling into fellowship is by gospel proclamation. Number two, our conception into fellowship is by divine adoption. The heretics of the day, they preached that salvation was only for the spiritual elite. But beloved, God did not choose you because you were greater than someone else. 
God did not choose you because you were pretty. God did not choose you for any other reason, but out of his great love, he set his eye upon you. Look with me in verse 3. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Now, I've thought about this. Here it is, John, he's, he's calling people into the family of God. But does he have a right to do that? I mean, it would be like Brother Jared coming to Louisa and inviting a bunch of people to my house for dinner. He has no right to do that, does he? Oh, but beloved, my son Mikey, he can invite anyone he wants to my table. Why? Because he's my son. Oh, don't you see, you proclaim the gospel from adoption. Our conception into this fellowship is by divine adoption. Now, let me read to you a piece of scripture. Ephesians chapter 1 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for, what? Adoption. As sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Oh, you see, our conception into this fellowship that we're talking about is by divine Adoption. God adopted you. Because of sin in the garden, we were born into a universal orphanage. No loving family, no home, no relationships, no lights, darkness, and hopelessness. Beloved, there are children around the world today lying in cribs with no mother or father, with no hope, with no lights, so much so that they don't even cry anymore because they know that no one will hear them. That's a sad, sad reality, isn't it? But Paul says that we were dead in our sins and trespasses. Even worse, was us. But God, being rich in mercy, He adopted us. He came looking for us. One old preacher said, He sent the hounds of heaven after you. And guess what? All those who He sets His eye on will be glorified one day. Aren't you glad for that? You see, beloved, your calling was by gospel proclamation. But your conception was by divine adoption. Calling into fellowship, adopted into fellowship. Well, let's move on. Number three, our confirmation of fellowship is by demonstration. You see, these people were teaching that salvation doesn't really change your behavior. That sounds a lot like some of the garbage they're preaching down in Louisa right now. Yeah. Beloved, no change, no Jesus. Did, did, I didn't hear you. Did you hear me? When God gets a hold of you, you are not the same. Ah, oh, Chris, you're sounding like one of them old Baptists. That's exactly what I'm sounding like. You know, in John 3, when Jesus is explaining to that man, he says the wind blows wherever it wills, and you don't know it. But then he describes it as what? The new birth. Oh, don't you see? That when God makes your heart new, things change. I've had people tell me before, Chris, if you, if you preach the way you do, you tell people that, that they are secure in God's grace, that people will live however they want to live. And I always say this, absolutely. You know why? Because their wanter's been changed. 
You believe that, don't you? The things that you used to want, you don't want them no more. And then when you do dip back into it, what happens? You can't stand it. Our confirmation of fellowship. Here's how you know. Here's how you're confirmed that you're in the fellowship with God and with his people is by this. It's by demonstration. It's the life that you live. Verse 5, this is the message we've heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I hear people telling me all the time, well, God, God wants me to do this and God wants me to do that. No, because I can say with surety that he doesn't want you doing that because one, that's sinful and, and God is light. There's no darkness at all. Aren't you glad that he never changes? Yeah, me too. I want you to see here, the Christian life is marked by a few things. Number one, look at verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Beloved, the Christian life is marked by a life of integrity. Now, I can tell by looking at this crowd before the lights went off that you haven't lived the perfect life, have you? No, but guess what? God if you're a believer, he's conforming you to the image of his dear son. And he's making you more and more like Jesus. And you know what that means? That means you live a life of integrity. We don't walk in darkness anymore. Why? Because God is light. Now, look in verse 7. A life marked by communion. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another... And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This Christian life is a life marked by communion with God. I ask you today, how do you have communion with God? Prayer, worship, and...